I think the motivations for why people are eating alternative proteins does differ. Um, so if you think about the U.S., what you see as a primary driver is really health. Environmental concerns, animal welfare, et cetera, are drivers that people list but are really secondary concerns. If you go to the UK, that uh, order of priorities and why people want to eat less meat, want to eat alternative proteins, actually reverses. I think in Asia, for centuries, populations within Asia have been eating plant-based proteins, and so the drivers there are very different. 95% of people we studied in a qualitative study said that health was one of the primary reasons, and over two-thirds said that it was the primary reason um, that they were eating all protein. I think another thing that was surprising is when you look at what they're substituting for and what they're eating less of to eat more of all proteins, it's not red meat and it's not burgers, it's actually really fast food or it's processed meats. They say, you know, I really want to eat less meat and I'm looking to move away from processed foods. In reality, the alternative proteins that are on the market today are processed foods. So there is really a disconnect between what consumers are saying they want as well as what they actually perceive to be true. I think one of the things that alt protein is really tapping into is this idea of eco-indulgence. So if there's some ecological benefit or there's some sustainability benefit, people will go ahead and indulge more happily. Well, I think we've seen a history where people are willing to shift their diet pretty dramatically. I mean, in the US, for example, 40 years ago, we ate 90 pounds of beef per person, now we eat 60. And we used to eat something like 40 pounds of chicken and now we eat 90. So there is room for material changes in diet. I already see, you know, younger parents bringing this into their children's food repertoire earlier on right now. You know, this will be a norm for a new generation of folks. I don't believe that traditional meat animal protein goes away in the next 10 years, but I do think this does become a meaningful part of diets across, across markets, across the U.S., Western Europe, um, and, and emerging markets as well consumption of alternative proteins will take more of a trajectory like what you've seen in alternative dairy or like what you've seen with organic meats, for example. It'll continue to be a niche segment. It'll be sizable, it'll be fast growing, but in reality will only be, call it 10 to 15 percent of future total consumption. Oh, look, I think this will be a material part of the food system. I think it's incredibly exciting, but I don't see a world where the hamburger's gone from your diet that chicken strips don't go on your salad. I think these are all um, staples that are gonna be part of our lives. Maybe not our grandchildren's lives, but our lives, I think some of this stuff is here to stay, and almost all of it. I would think very, very much about consumer adoption, which you need to think about at a regional level, because again, this is food. So diets are very different in different parts of the world, and there are gonna be some surprises about who actually picks up this stuff faster versus slower. Paying attention to where the unit economics are going to fall or could fall for each of these technologies will also be material because candidly that's going to drive adoption of what, what you can charge and how attractive it can be from a margin perspective. In my mind there's actually bigger shocks beyond alternative protein that could happen to the protein industry that folks should be paying attention to. You've got African swine fever that's taken out. Predictions are by end of 2019, almost half of the pork population in China. If that happens to be true, that's roughly a quarter of the world's pork supply. My craziest prediction about protein consumption in 2030 is that in every fast food, fast casual outlet, fine dining establishment, there will be multiple options on the menu for flexitarian and lessitarian consumers. It won't be just like the one vegetarian option at the bottom of the menu kind of segregated by itself. It will be as delicious and competitive with, with, with the other options on the menu. Where I think this gets pretty interesting is when we get to a point where we can make a steak that is indistinguishable from a traditional steak or alternative French cheese that is indistinguishable from the best camembert in the world. Uh, I think that's a ways out, but will be an interesting moment when we get there.